This is a resource of Just Loving God. Knowing the Power of God, from Matthew 22, verses 23 to 33. Know the power of God. Matthew 22, verse 23. That same day, the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him with a question. Teacher, they said, Moses told us that if a man dies without having children, his brother must marry the widow and raise up offspring for him. Now, there were seven brothers among us. The first one married and died. And since he had no children, he left his wife to his brother. The same thing happened to the second and the third brother, right on down to the seventh. Finally, the woman died. Now then, at the resurrection, whose wife will she be of the seven, since all of them were married to her? Jesus replied, you are in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. At the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. But about the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what God said to you? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the crowds heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. The background here to the Sadducees is that because they didn't believe there was a resurrection, therefore there was no afterlife. They said that the Torah says nothing about resurrection. And Jesus' point to the Sadducees was simple. He went straight to the Torah the only books that they considered authoritative. And he showed that God had revealed himself to Moses at the burning bush as actively in relationship with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Thus, they couldn't be non-existent. If they're still living, this must be because God will in fact raise them from the dead. Jesus is saying that God is powerful. Death, life, and resurrection are in his hands. God created a good world and he's actually gonna come back and make all things right, including reuniting his people with their bodies in the final resurrection. And he silenced the Sadducees' ignorance. These were scholars, allegedly. These were men who took pride in knowing the scriptures or the bits of them that they considered were valid. And even those bits they didn't even know. You are in error he says, because you don't know the scriptures. Let's look at that point first, knowing scripture. They didn't know the text, they didn't know the meaning of the text, and they didn't know the spirit of the text. It's so basic, they didn't even know what the text said. They were so blinded by their stubborn, arrogant, self-pleasing, doctrinal position that they would not see what God said. All that mattered to them was being right and being consistent with their tradition and being victorious in a debate. They came sneering to Jesus. They were preaching a theological system instead of the person of Christ. You do err. You are in error, he said. You are mistaken, you are ignorant. You don't even know the text. You don't know the meaning of the text. The text points to me, he said. And they didn't know the spirit of the text. The letter had killed them. The form, the shape, the mold of religious truth, stripped of the power of the spirit, had brought blindness and deafness and dullness of death into their lives. Matthew Henry, that great minister said, even the New Testament will be a killing letter if shown as a mere system or form and without dependence on God, the Holy Spirit to give it a quickening power. Jesus had already warned them back in John chapter five. He said, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you might have life. 
the whole of the Torah, the whole of the prophets, the whole of the writings. Talk about Jesus. That's the whole point. But you won't come to me. I heard of a man once who, living in abject sin, but he decided that he would start studying Hebrew and Greek as if this would somehow impress God. <laughs> Killed by the letter that should bring life. Paul points out in 1 Corinthians 4.20, for the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. It's the spirit that gives life. Don't lean on your own understanding. Don't do it. Acknowledge him in all your ways. The logos, the word, is Jesus. The life is Jesus. John 6, Jesus says, the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and their life. Those are the only words that matter. The ones Jesus speaks to you. The one God himself speaks into your soul. All scripture is breathed out by God, all of it. And it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. If only they had known the spirit of the text, if only they had known the spirit that gives life, they would have understood the power of God. They would have known the righteousness of God, the goodness, the strength, the might of God, the providence, the omnipotence of God. They would have had the Holy Spirit's revelation of the mysteries prepared by God for those who love and wait for him, which no eye had seen, no ear had heard since the beginning of time, but they're revealed to us now by his Holy Spirit, and they could have been revealed to them. So they didn't know the scriptures. We have to know the scriptures. We have to know the text. Some people haven't even read the Bible through, and they think they can teach they haven't even read it. Well, they've read a bit of it. And they think, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty clever. I'm qualified. They haven't even read the text. How can they know the meaning of this beautiful ark of Scripture if they haven't read it? And then you must know the spirit of the text. But this is worse for the Sadducees. They didn't know that, and they didn't know the power of God either. He says, you are in error because you do not know the power of God. Oh my goodness me, so many have got as far as knowing the text. Some have got as far as knowing the text really well. Some of them have got to the level of trying to decipher the meaning of the text, but they don't know the power of God. And they kill using the letter. The Mosaic law brought death because we could not keep the law because the flesh is weak. That's why God had to do this for us. That's why he had to step in. But these Sadducees, they didn't understand God's omnipotence. They didn't understand anything. They were blind. They didn't experience God's power at all. Their lives were empty. They had dead faith. They said, well, we believe in Yahweh. We believe in the God of Israel. We believe the stories, but their faith was dead because it had no works. It didn't outwork in any way in understanding, in faith toward God. It was dead. So dead faith isn't faith. I'll tell you this, unless your children, those of you who have them, know the difference between the text and the power, God help them. Our kids have to know the power of God. They have to. They can't just know Bible stories. They have to know that God is alive. He rose from the dead. He stands amongst us. Hmm. Our kids have to know this for themselves. They have to. Can't be secondhand. Those who are entrusted to our care have to know this. We might not have kids. Well, there's people around you who must know the power of God. I tell you, if you think you can evangelize to people by just telling them stories and going through 
stuff, religious things with them. You can't. The Holy Spirit has to speak through you. They have to see the power of God at work in your life. They have to see it. Otherwise, it means nothing to them. And kids are smart. Young people are smart. Someone said to me, why are there so many young people in your church? I said, because they're smart. (laughs) They want reality. They're fed up of entertainment and games. They've seen all the smoke machines and the purple lights. They've seen all the big, trancey concerts. You can get that from Coldplay. Great musicians, but they'll take you to hell. They won't help you. They're fed up with it. They want reality. I want to say, okay, if you say God's real, I want to know. I want to see. I want to experience the reality of God in my life. I'm done with games. Tired of it. My parents played games. I don't want to play games. If I have to play games, I'm out. I'm out. I'll just go and play in the world. And so many do. God help us. God forgive us for our lack of power. Our lack of being on our face before the Lord and saying, Lord, unless you speak through me, nothing gets said. Judges 2.10. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord. All the work that he had done for Israel. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. It just breaks my heart. I see this everywhere. They do not know the God of Israel. And they're told, we'll give you a worship experience. Come along, we'll give you a great weekend experience. People don't need an experience. They don't need a theater show. They don't need a bunch of puppets. They've got to meet God. They have to meet him. They have to meet him. They've got to know both the scriptures and the power of God. The two go hand in hand. Hmm. These Pharisees didn't know either. They didn't even recognize him. They didn't recognize God's power and it was standing right in front of them. Luke 19, verse 41, as Jesus drew near Jerusalem, he saw the city and he wept over it. He said, if you, even you had only known on this day what would bring you peace, But now it's hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. He was standing in front of you. And you didn't even know who he was. May God grant us the grace. May God grant us the power of the living God through his Holy Spirit to minister to those around us. May God grant us the power of the river of life flowing out of our belly. They didn't know it, they didn't recognize it, and they didn't believe it, these guys. They didn't believe God's power. They were just like the 10 spies and all the Israelites, exactly the same. God was standing right in front of them by his actions and by his visible presence. And they still did not believe God's power. Totally different than Jehoshaphat or Meshach, Shadrach and Abednego about to be thrown into the fiery furnace. Totally different. Look at the contrast. Even if God doesn't save us, we're still not going to bow down to you. (laughs) And he was the fourth man in the fire. And he was in the two men, Joshua and Caleb. May God grant us the spirit of the living God to believe his power in the face of all opposition. Reminds me of the disciples. (laughs) Jesus warned them before his crucifixion. He said, I am going to be taken and I'm going to be captured, and they are going to kill me. And then I'm going to rise again on the third day. And do you know what the next sentence is? It says, and they were greatly distressed. Let's just rewind. They're going to take me, they're going to kill me, and I'm going to rise again on the third day, and they were greatly distressed. 
they didn't believe the power of God. All they heard was, they're going to kill me. They couldn't even hear, and I'm going to rise again on the third day. They had no conception. They had no, they had no strength of spirit inside them to say, ah, but God can raise the dead. Let us not be like them. These Sadducees mocked God. They thought they'd come up with a scenario that was so clever, they just made a mockery of resurrection. They thought they'd catch him out. He would stumble. He'd say, well, I, oh, I don't know. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe she's got seven husbands in the resurrection. Oh, I don't know. They would have laughed and walked off. See, of course there's no resurrection. Fools. They were unwilling in the day of his power. They were unwilling when he mustered his army. When he called, they were unwilling. Joshua believed. Jesus came to him and he said, as the captain of the Lord's host, I am now come. But these Sadducees were not willing. But we say with the psalmist, Psalm 110, what a, what a psalm this is. This is all about Jesus. This is nothing about the psalmist. This is all about Jesus. Psalm 110 verse three, your people, this is God's people we're talking about now. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power. Or another translation has it, your troops will be willing on the day of battle. God's called you to war. We must be willing. And then it goes on in Psalm 110. It says, these troops are arrayed in holy splendor. That's priest's garments. Holy garments, holy splendor. That's the garments of the priest. We're priest warriors. We're warrior priests. As we offer sacrifices to the king, I tell you, he lays ambushes. We go to war, except he does all the fighting. The power of the living God in us. Expect a miracle. Expect a miracle. Recognize it, trust it, believe it, and step into the power of God. Just expect a miracle in your life. Oh, well, I prayed and it didn't happen. Expect a miracle in your life. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Today is the day of salvation. So let's assume we do know the scriptures. Some of you don't yet. You better catch up. You better get reading. You better read prayerfully. Say, God, teach me. That's just the first base. Let us go on into maturity. So let's assume we know the scriptures. We've got to know the power. It works around us, it works in us, and it must work through us. That's why we've laid the foundations this weekend. If you're not clear about the atonement, if you're not clear about your standing before the great judge of heaven, if you're not clear, clear-headed, strong in the faith, on the rock of his love and his forgiveness and his divine forgetfulness, then you can't begin to walk in the power of God. Because you're worried, you're, you're faltering, you're, oh I, don't, oh, I don't know, I don't know. You can't get that clear, get it straight. So you've got to know the scripture, you've got to know its meaning. And you've got to know the Holy Spirit in scripture. And then you will know the power. I promise you. God's power does things. It gives life. It gives life now. And this is what the Sadducees didn't understand. It gives life in the afterlife. He's the God of the living He's not the God of the dead. There's a, that's going to be a concrete life. It's going to be as real as, in fact, it's going to be more real than this, more vibrant, more concrete. It's going to be eternal. It's going to be physical, but glorified. But it's going to be as real as the nose on your face. You see, God, the Holy Spirit, gives life. He gives new motives, and he gives new desires, and he gives heart loves. I like to call them heart loves. He gives you new heart loves. He gives you things you never loved before, and you just start loving them. Some, some of you have got confused. You say, oh, I don't know what happened to me. I just love new things. <laughs> we know what happened to you. He gives the power to walk in the faith that allows righteousness to be imputed to us. His power does everything. His power works through faith that works by love. Everything works by love, the love of God. Do you know the power of God? Do you know the power of God in creation? When you look at creation, do you know his power? Do you see his power there? 
You need to. He isn't creation. We're not pantheists, but they declare his handiwork. Do you believe the power of God, that the power that spoke the massiveness of space into existence? Who made the estimated 200 billion trillion stars? Some guy wasted 12 years of his life working that out. <laughs> 200 billion trillion. Trillions a lot, but there's 200 billion of those trillions. Do you believe in the power of the God that created all those stars? Do you know what the psalmist says? He says, he determines the number of the stars and gives to all of them their names. He's named every star. I wonder what our son is called. Roger, I don't know. Bob, <laughs> Sally, I have no idea. Great is our Lord, he says, and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. Do you believe in the power of God that thrust Everest 29,000 feet into the air? That's five and a half miles. Two tectonic plates colliding. Thrust that mountain and the Himalayas up into the sky. Do you believe the power that proves that his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and his divine nature, have been clearly seen ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made? so that all men are without excuse. Do you believe in the God who is revealed that way in nature? I do. Look at nature different tomorrow. Go out and look at it and say, wow, this speaks of the divine nature. There can't be this without a divine nature behind it. This can't be without the power of a deity behind it. Can't be. That's why they're without excuse. That's why there's no atheist. There's no such thing. There's no excuse. They can see. Do you believe in the God who does miracles? That's creation. What about miracles? How about the God that through Peter and John healed the emaciated legs of the cripple man at the beautiful gate? Easy for God. It's nothing. Do you believe in the God of miracles who can give you a new job? I do. Do you believe in the God of miracles who can give you a husband, a clean man, clean, wholesome, godly? Do you believe in that God of miracles? I do. How about world affairs? Do you believe in the power of God who controls the course of world events, who removes kings and sets up other kings, who gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the scholars, Daniel says. Do you believe in that God? I do. Do you believe in the God that destroyed empires? The empires of the Han Dynasty, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, the Mongols, the Ottomans. Empire after empire, he just felled them like a piece of grass. The Japanese, the Nazi Third Reich, the Russians, the British. He knocked the legs out from under them, haughty men. Do you believe in the God of miracles? who simply dispensed with tyrants, just flicks them out of the way with his finger when he's done. He dispenses with the tyrannies of France's Napoleon, Italy's Mussolini, Germany's Adolf Hitler, Russia's Stalin, Cambodia's Pol Pot, Paraguay's Alfredo Strozna, Libya's Colonel Gaddafi, Iraq's Saddam Hussein, Uganda's Idi Amin, Romania's Nikolai Ceausescu, Serbia's Slobodan Milosevic. Do you believe in the God who can just flick tyrants and evil people out of the way when he's done? I do. Do you believe in the God who sets up kingdoms and puts them down? I do. Or are you ignorant of the power of God? Do you sit there rubbing your hands together, fretting, saying, oh, I don't know, I've got to fix this. God sets up and God sets down. Do you know the power of God that Moses knew? Exodus 15, he says, your right hand is glorious in power. He says, God, whose right hand shatters the enemy. Do you know the power of God as David did in 1 Chronicles 29? He said, to whom belongs the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and earth is his. And his is the kingdom 
who is exalted as head over all, and wealth and honor come from him, the ruler of all things. Do you believe in that God? That God of power. David was set up by God, and he says, this isn't my kingdom. God owns this kingdom. How often we see men taking the gifts of God and thinking they own it, taking the callings of God and say, yes, this is mine. I own this. Look at all I have, said Nebuchadnezzar upon his balcony one day. And God said, that is enough. You will be like a beast of the field eating grass for seven years. Herod made a great oration and he fell down and he was eaten by worms. Oh, the arrogance and foolishness of men. This is the great God. You believe in the God of miracles whose grace is sufficient, whose power is made perfect in weakness. Do you believe in that God of miracles? I do. Do you believe in the God of miracles such that the eyes of your heart have been enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he's called you? The power of God has to be revealed to you so that you can know this hope to which he's called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe? We read this because Paul writes sometimes very long sentences. And so it sort of blurs as we read it. We go, well, I don't know, it's too many superlatives. <laughs> Paul was trying his very hardest to express something that really can't be expressed in human language. This has to be revealed by God. The immeasurable greatness. That means the greatness that can't be measured in any way at all. There is just no way of measuring it. They can't measure space. And space is this infinitesimally small dot, dare I say it, a molecule on God's hand. And that's, that's making God too small. What is the immeasurable greatness of his power? If you just knew the power of God that works in you, if you knew, you would speak differently into situations. If you knew the power of God that works in you, you would pray different. If you understood the power of God that works in you, oh, you would speak different. You would look at people different. You'd look at the world different. You'd look at creation different. You'd look at problems differently. What is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe? That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and then seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms. The dead body of Jesus needed the might of the living God to raise him. And that's the same power that works in you. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. Do you know that God? that power. You can, just believe it. Start to act on it, because it's already in you, if so be, the Spirit of God is in you. It's in you. You don't have to wait for some experience. Yes, he'll fill you over and over and over and over again, and you must come to him. Open your heart. Let him fill you again and again with the Holy Spirit. But I tell you, you have all that you need for Christ lives in you. The Father lives in you. The Holy Spirit lives in you. It's not just the Holy Spirit that lives in you, like some disembodied spirit of God. Jesus said, I'll send another comforter and I will come and live with you and the Father will come. The whole of God, all of God, as each person is, is in us. This changes everything. Do you believe in the power of God that says, the Lord is my light and salvation? We sang it. Who is like the Lord our God? Do you believe in the spirit that empowers you to say, whom shall I fear? That says, the Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Psalm 27. David understood this most of the time. <laughs> he vacillated like we do. Well, let's do better. We have the indwelling Holy Spirit now. Do you believe in the power of God that allows you to rest in the fact that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him. All authority. That's over sickness in your life. It is. It's over mental anguish. It's over emotional turmoil. 
It's over circumstance and it's over people. Time and time and time and time and time again, we as a family have witnessed God turning people just at his whim to do his bidding to bless us. People who hate God. We've seen it so many times that I have no doubt anymore that God is the God of all men. He's the God of all hearts. He turns them as he wills. They might roll dice and they might make plans, but he determines the way the lot falls. He does. They don't. And all this power now resides in you. You say, I just, I don't get it. I'm, I'm not getting this. I know this must be true, but I, I, I'm, not, I'm not feeling any like vibrations. I've got fire coming out my fingers. Surely my feet should be tingling at least. You don't need tingles. You don't need cheap street magic. You need to know and understand. That's where the, the harvest comes from. You know, the seeds that are sown in good soil, Jesus said, they that understand. They do what I say because they understand what I say. And then that brings forth a harvest. Some 40, some 60, some 100 fold. Building our house on the rock means that we attend to the word of God. We say, I'm going to align my thinking with this. doesn't matter what you feel. It's true. Okay? Align yourself. The feelings will come, maybe, later. You don't need them. We like feelings, though, don't we? Just believe it and start acting on it. And you will witness, irregardless of you, the fruit of God in other people around you. And you will realize, and I think very often God stops us feeling anything, because then we might have thought, whoa, yeah, I'm so on this, I'm so passionate. This is why that person got saved, or this is why that person was encouraged and blessed. No. It's the Spirit of God working through you, dummy. Come on. Stop claiming things that aren't yours. All the glory is His. All the power and all the dominion and all the praise and all the honor goes to Him. So start to act on this truth. The power of God that raised Jesus' dead body lives in you, works in you, ceaselessly. It doesn't stop working in you. Night and day, he's working in you to cause you to desire his will, to cause you to do his will. He's motivating you. You're so used to his grace. You're so used to his presence, you don't even realize what's going on. You've got so... A, 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 so used to it. This is amazing. Remember the day, if you can, when you didn't know. It's hard to remember. We forget, don't we? But bring it to mind. So what are the results of all of this? Well, the results of knowing God's power. Knowing the scriptures. Firstly, it surprises us. Because we see that his power is not from us. It flows through us. It's a grace gift. All his gifts are grace gifts. People say to me all the time, oh, I want the, I want the gifts that, you know, are really important sounding and fancy. And, you know, I want some prominence. I want people to see how powerful, you know, I've got these power gifts. And, oh, dear, dear, dear. Little baby. Put your rattle down. Take the little sucker thing out of your mouth. Start eating a steak, for goodness sakes. These are the gifts of the Holy Spirit. He does all the work. He does everything. Doesn't matter what you see, what you feel, what you think is going on, he's working. We have no idea the fruit. He sometimes blesses us and lets us see some quick fruit. It's wonderful. But I tell you, half the time you don't know. You sow seeds and you trust the Spirit to do the work. It surprises us when we do see the results because when we're truly letting him flow, we didn't do it. And we go, wow, you used me? Through my agency, that person was healed or brought to life? Yes, through your agency. You are appointed as an agent of God. He's the principal, you're the agent. He does far more than we can even ask. And that's quite a lot. We can ask a lot, can't we? And he does far more than we can even imagine. We can imagine even more than we can ask, I think. 
Sometimes we can imagine just incredible, fantastical things, and he could do way more than that. That's nothing. And if we're honest, we could never have done these things. We just couldn't have done them. So the first thing this does, knowing the scriptures and knowing the power of God, is it surprises us. And I tell you, be encouraged. I tell you, take the food that God's given us this weekend, go out and start to live it. Just do it. Just step over the boat. You say, well, that's water. (laughs) Just step over the boat and you'll find it holds you. Just do it. Step out. Just go and pray for someone. If you feel moved in the mall to go and speak to someone, do it. For goodness sakes, fluff it up, mess it up, doesn't matter. Just go and do it. Watch the Holy Spirit work in spite of you. That's his gift. It's him that does it all anyway. Second thing it does is it humbles us. (laughs) Because it's all of grace. It shows our dependency on him. For without me, you can do nothing said Jesus. That's pretty blunt. It's a bit insulting. No, it's wonderful. Takes all the weight off. He carries the yoke. It's just sort of resting gently on our shoulders and he's doing all the pulling. We just walk along next to him, think we're plowing. It's hilarious. It's hilarious, honestly. We're merely branches, you know, but he's the vine that gives life. We get so proud of our big leaves and Oh, there's a grape growing. Look at me. (laughs) I have a grape. But without him, you just wither and die. We're merely tributaries fed by the great river whose source is the heavenly Hermon, flows down from the mountain of God. And we just flow off him, little tributaries, little streamlets, little creeks. We're mere dark moons with no light of ourselves, reflecting his glory. We have no light in ourself. Do you understand that? It's just a lump of rock. But he made you shiny so that you could reflect his glory. Even before the word is on my tongue, you know all about it, O Lord. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's too high. I cannot comprehend it said David in Psalm 139. He couldn't get it, so you're in good company. You just accept it. The third thing, knowing the scriptures and knowing the power of God does, it doesn't just surprise us, it doesn't just humble us, but it thrills us. Why? Because it's of grace. He permits our agency, as I said. The dark moon becomes a light to those in darkness. Wow, that's thrilling. Someone says, thank you for shining the light of God onto me. And you say, well, actually, I don't have any light. I just reflect it. It thrills us because he shares the joy of God's ministry with us. There is definitely no rational reason that I can think of that God would share his ministry with us, but he delights to do it. When you come together, each of you has a hymn, a lesson or a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue or an interpretation, for you can all prophesy in turn so that everyone may be instructed and encouraged. It's thrilling to be used by God. When I said, who's got a song for the Lord? Do you know what? Next time, just sing. I can't sing, but I still do it. Just sing to the Lord. Give him the praise of your heart. In the great congregation, I will declare your name, O Lord. Do you know what? If you are silent and you zip it, the rocks are going to cry out. Mm -mm, That's not good. I don't want no rock crying out instead of me. So I'm going to declare the goodness of God. I'm going to speak. So that's the third thing, it thrills us because he uses us for some reason. The fourth thing is it delights him. Psalm 149, verse four. The Lord takes pleasure in his people. It's just as simple as that. I hope you're getting this now by this stage. The Lord takes pleasure in you. He crowns the humble with victory. 
God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints and still do. That's what the writer to the Hebrews says in chapter six. He's not forgetful. He doesn't overlook your work and your labor of love for the saints. He doesn't overlook that. He doesn't forget that. You say, but I don't feel like it's very rewarding. I'm tired and so much to do and it's endless. <laughs> Just keep going, keep walking, keep rejoicing. He doesn't forget. It thrills him, it delights him that we walk in faithfulness. Like I said today, earlier, he loves you the same way he loves Jesus. And this is the son in whom he delights. So you are like the firstborn son who inherits everything. That's why we're called sons in the scriptures, because we are like the firstborn son who inherits all of the father's estate. Zephaniah 3, 17, the Lord your God is in your midst. Oh, is he ever. A mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you. This delights God's heart. That we know the scriptures and his power. It delights him. Because we walk in his ways and he exalts over us. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing. He will say, well done good and faithful servant. You say, oh, I, I don't know, I can't imagine that. I'm not very faithful, I'm definitely not very good. You've got to understand where it comes from. It comes from Christ. He is your sanctification. He is your goodness. He is your acceptance with the Father, and in him you stand. Get up, oh beloved Daniel. Stand up, stop groveling on the floor. Stand up in the liberty wherewith Christ has made you free. Stand up. Come boldly. I'm calling you. It's okay. So obviously, the outcome of all this is we must know the scriptures backwards. Of course, we must. Never take that lightly. Study to show yourself approved. Work hard. Don't be lazy. You say, oh, sometimes I don't feel any inspiration at all. I'm just reading. Good. You're faithful. What do you think faithful is? Goosebumps all the way? That's not what faithful means, is it? If you look in the dictionary, faithful, faithful, faithful. Continuous goosebumps. And that's what it says, is it? It's not the definition of faithful. <laughs> faithful is through thick and thin. Faithful is when you don't feel like it. The power of God is working in you. Allow the power of God to have something to work with. <laughs> he can't remind you of all the things he said if you never read them. You've got to meet Jesus on the road to Emmaus. You've got to. He's got to teach you. He's got to do the instruction. You've got to know his resurrection power. See, those two lads on the, maybe it was Cleopas and his wife, I don't know, but those two people on that road to Emmaus, they didn't know, they were still in that distressed state. All they could think about, oh, they're going to kill me. They didn't listen to a word he said, they, and then I'm going to raise again the third day. This was the third day. They should have been going, or... Oh, He's going to appear any minute. I, he, he said he's rising, so it's got to be true. But no, they were downcast. You've got to know his resurrection power. He lives. Oh, I tell you, he lives. It's time to trust him for the uncontrollable wind of the Holy Spirit. You can't control this. Jesus said to Nicodemus, it's people who are filled with this spirit, i.e. me, God, people don't know where they're coming from. People don't know where they're going. They confuse people. They can't make you out. They look at you and they go, hmm, you, ooh, what, what are you? Who, what makes you tick? That's the Holy Spirit. You'll end up a mystery to the seed of the bond. Hagar's child was Ishmael, seed of the slave woman. Not the seed of promise. We're of the seed of promise. By faith, we are of the seed of promise. We're of the faith lineage of Abraham. The seed of the bond is always at odds with the seed of the free. Always. Always. It's in them. It's just part of their spirit. They're subject to the spirit of disobedience. All they ever do is disobey God. And you will be confusing to them. Wonderful. That some of them might be plucked out of hell and saved. Others, I'm afraid, will be condemned to an even hotter hell. 
because they encountered the living God in you and they did not know the day of their visitation. It's time to let go of the comfy seat in your boat and step over the edge. He's called you, so it's safe. Peter checked first, didn't he? He said, Lord, if it's you, just, just call me. And he said, yeah, okay, it's me, come. So Pete got out the boat and the water held him. He's called, so because you've committed your life to him, you've committed your soul in response to his salvation, you've committed what you can commit to him, which is everything. You've committed your soul and your body to him for his service. He'll get you there. For I know whom I have believed, Paul said. I know whom I've believed. I know him. How did he know him? He spent time with him. He spent time immersed in the scriptures. He spent time on his road to Emmaus, letting the Lord teach him. I know whom I've believed. I know whom I believed in the scriptures. And I know whom I believed by the working of his power in me. I know whom I've believed. And I'm persuaded. That's it. I'm persuaded now that he is able to keep that which I've committed to him. He's got, he's got your soul. He's got your life. He's got your future. He's certainly got your past. Don't worry about that. He's got your future and he's got your present. And he's got it until that great day. He hasn't just got it for a, a few years or a few months. He's got it until the great day of his return. It's okay, you know, he's called you. Come on, it's okay. Just step out. It's safe. He knows what you've committed to him and he's keeping it. He says, okay, I'm calling you. He's calling you, so rejoice, O oh Christian, that you've been called. There's not enough rejoicing in churches. There should be dancing, like David danced in churches. Oh, well, I come from a Mennonite background, we don't dance. I'm a Baptist. We don't dance, goodness me. I'm a Methodist. Oh, God help us. Rejoice, O Christian. Lift up your voice and sing eternal hallelujahs to Jesus Christ the King. The hope of all who seek him, the help of all who find. None other is so loving, so good and kind. He lives, he lives. Christ Jesus lives today. And he walks with me and he talks with me along life's narrow way. So wrote the hymn writer. He understood this. Rejoice, O Christian. There's no greater sound than his call. Oh, oh what music to the soul. The call of the master. Come on, he bids you, come. It's okay, Bartimaeus, come. He's calling you. Oh, music to his ears. <laughs> and he cast away his rags and he stood up and he came to the king of kings. Rejoice, he has called you. There's no greater privilege. There's no greater truth than his scriptures. There's no greater power than his indwelling Holy Spirit. And it is in you. He is in you. God is in you. All of God is in you. Don't be like the Sadducees. Of all men most miserable. They had no hope in the resurrection. If Jesus be not raised, we have no faith. Our faith is in vain. We're of all men most miserable. So open your heart to the God of power, the great loving God. Jesus told them, he says, I'm gonna send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. He empowers us. Pentecost has come. Be open to him. Let him fill you again. Spend enough time with him. And what do you do when you spend time with God? You say, well, I don't really know. I don't know, after about five minutes, I'm not really sure what to say anymore. I don't know what to do. I try and read a bit, try and pray. And do you know what? Worship God. Do what we did tonight. You've got to grow up so that you don't need someone else to lead you in that all the time. You have to be able to do this on your own. You have to take time away. It's hard. You have to make the time. You have to get a space where you can't be distracted. The phone has to be off. No one can see you there. You can't be worried about other things. You can't have any distractions. You have to find a place. I've driven up into the mountains. I've driven up into orchards. I've gone and walked down the rows of apple trees and laid in the long grass to hide from the view of people. 
at 5.30 in the morning in the wet dew because I have to have a place where I know it's just me and God and I can't be disturbed. Give him time. Learn to do this. It's nice when someone else leads you, isn't it? But nice piano going, nice singing, it's all lovely. But you've got to do it yourself with no music. That should be the music of your soul rejoicing that he's called you. Learn to do this. Grow, grow, grow. This is the year of growth, I'm telling you. It's going to be uncomfortable for those of you who don't want to grow this year. <laughs> it's going to feel like those Chinese foot bindings. Not going to feel nice. Pentecost has come. You've waited and today's the day. Today's the day of decision. Today's the day, right, Lord. Okay, I am going to walk in your power. I'm just going to believe you. I'm going to grow up enough that I'm not reliant on my feelings all the time. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church. Let that ever be said of this little church. To him be glory in the church. I believe we glorified him tonight. I believe we exalted him tonight. I believe we bowed our knees before the great, wondrous King. And we joined the hosts of heaven, whoever sing, holy, holy, holy is the Lamb. Worthy, worthy, worthy is he to receive praise and honor and riches and glory and power and wisdom. We joined with them. Let's do that every day. So who is God? He's the God of the living. We'll talk about that a bit tomorrow. The power of God that works in you. Are you getting it? Are you beginning to just say, hmm, there's more going on in me than I was giving it credit. There's more happening in me than I, I realized. And I can rejoice in that. Okay, so go out and do it. Go out and speak. Go out and pray. Go out and be a light. Go out and be salt. Doesn't matter if it stings people. So go out and be light, okay? Be salt, be power. Let God flow through you and give him the praise and the honor. Amen.